Hello everyone, this is Galacticus X coming back to you with another video. <clears throat> this time with a, a much delayed response to a terrific video made by Dean Thompson, aka Winnie Corleone 62, which he published uh, about two weeks ago. So the subject, the question Dean poses is why do we play our games? <clears throat> now for me gaming is something I've always been attracted to um, but I didn't get into until I was in my early high school years and junior high so um, first experiences matter a lot and perhaps they can define the path that you later follow and for me entering the world of gaming came from uh, from the perspective of PC not consoles and uh, not 8-bit home micros although I played quite a lot with my friends who had uh, uh, 8-bit systems so from, uh, from one aspect I was fortunate to experience Get the, from the get-go um, technically superior games that benefited from 16-bit architecture and uh, fast loading times you know from floppy disk drives um, I was able to expand the machine uh, to enhance the audiovisual fidelity of the games with uh, additional cards, etc., and peripherals. So, I didn't experience the limitations of, uh, you know, very low memory, tape loading times of the 8-bit machines. But uh, it it started a bit rough because my first PC had really atrocious arcade games compared to machines like the Commodore 64 or the. Nintendo Entertainment System, but uh, on the other hand, it could do very well uh, with uh, 3D adventure games that were just getting into the mainstream with companies like uh, Sierra Online and uh, uh, Lucasfilm Games, which later, which later on became Lucas Arts. So, 3D adventures and strategy games were. Uh, um, a completely different proposition from arcade games and um, what I was looking for were exactly this kind of these guys this kind of games these games that could uh, recreate whole environments in a realistic way more or less um, er, worlds that I could immerse myself into I wasn't at all interested in uh, Twitch high reflexive, high reflexive uh, gaming. I was accustomed to more thoughtful, strategic, and uh, slow-paced games. So um, it was beneficial too, practical, because uh, I learned uh, to speak English from adventure games, and uh, I could uh, really enrich my vocabulary with uh, their help. So. Uh, later on, into the late uh, 1990s, I shifted my interest towards uh, 3D shooters. It was the era where uh, all the rage back then uh, started with uh, Wolfenstein 3D, then with uh, Doom, Quake, uh, Duke Nukem, and then came the revolution of open world games. Uh, not with uh, the meaning that we and the connotation uh, that uh, we use today. Uh, back then, open world in the early 2000s were just were uh, just uh, taking. Uh, it was just taking the action out of closed spaces and uh, out into the open. Um, 
This was a shocking experience and I don't think uh, this particular experience can be replicated. Uh, I mean moving out from uh, narrow corridors, uh, enclosed spaces and dungeons and uh, being uh, all of a sudden being surrounded by urba urban landscapes or uh, natural uh, locations. Um, of course the machines of the time were limited back then and uh, you had your uh, artificial barricades, your uh, invisible walls, uh, your uh, coarse uh, textures and low polygons. Uh, but games like uh, Halo, the first Halo, Halo Combat Evolved, uh, Far Cry, uh, Half-Life 2, they were uh, unbelievable in the sense that uh, your character was, uh, you know, out there in the in the world wilderness. And and then came uh, games like uh, uh, Morrowind, Fallout 3. <coughs> you know, really uh, open world games with non-linear linear progression that. Uh, combined uh, adventure and uh, RPG elements and of course action uh, shooting or hack and slash that uh, recreated uh, strange worlds fantasy uh, uh, didn't, they didn't hold your hand they let you make your own decisions which impacted uh, the rest of the world and uh, the storyline with uh, sometimes lasting and permanent consequences, but also had a consistent narrative story thread, a backstory that uh, tied up the whole world, uh, everything together, this uh, unique universe, and uh, gave it uh, purpose and uh, meaning. So this was my background uh, in summation, and I didn't, and I have to say, uh, back in these days, um, when I had a lot of uh, a lot less time to game because uh, I was uh, in the early years of my career and I was pushing hard to establish myself uh, at work, I missed quite a few uh, of uh, some excellent titles that I only uh, discovered uh, much later and uh, up to this day I keep. I keep uh, discovering games from uh, 20 or uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago that I want to to play for the first time, or some of these I want to, to revisit and play again. I remember uh, quite a few of them. Um, the first uh, two Fallout games, the Thief series, uh, the not the, the recent one by Ubisoft, the original ones, the, the two first uh, Elder Scroll, uh, Elder Scrolls titles be, uh, before uh, Morrowind, uh, Arena and Daggerfall. Daggerfall, which was absolutely huge, and I had absolutely no idea how enormous it was. And I have to say, I only realized what Daggerfall was uh, just a few days ago. Uh, by watching a, a Let's Play video on uh, Razorfist's channel, uh, which I suggest, which I suggest you go and watch. Um, uh, speaking of Daggerfall and the whole uh, Elder Scrolls series, it's uh, it's great to uh, sit back and just to watch. Uh, just contemplate where it began uh, its roots and um, what it has evolved into you should go and uh, watch the interview with uh, Julian Jensen uh, the so-called father of the Elder Scrolls series um, uh, the interview he gave to to Indigo Gaming, uh, a very good, a very nice uh, gaming channel, 
it's a, a, a large three-hour interview um, but you can just listen to it while you are doing uh, like a podcast while you're doing something else it's extremely uh, interesting and revealing not only um, regarding the elder, the elder scrolls things but uh, for quite a lot of other things in the gaming industry from the perspective of an experienced <coughs> developer so yeah go and listen to Jensen's original version original I'm sorry original vision of the classic RPG with uh, tons of uh, you know tons of uh, classes and subclasses and uh, uh, customization and uh, non-linear linear progression in a world where the the NPCs and uh, the world in general are uh, they move and uh, shape they are, they are shaped by your uh, actions and decisions uh, it's a dynamic uh, world and contra con contrast contrast this with uh, what uh, Todd Howard did with uh, subsequent Bethesda games as he took over and um, as a creative director starting from Morrowind all the way up to, to Skyrim uh, and how the games became less of an RPG and more of an uh, adventure game with a more strict narrative um, uh, restricted uh, scope and the um, size of the world and uh, reduced world size yeah and uh, at the end uh, a less satisfying uh, role playing uh, aspect with uh, much less uh, with uh, uh, way less options less um, flexibility with uh, fewer options and uh, less flexibility and more shallow uh, in that regard so anyway uh, since the middle of the last decade where the, this um, transition took place um, I started uh, gaming in uh, consoles. Uh, I think it was what is it? Uh, uh, the, the sixth generation of consoles is that uh, when uh, PlayStation 2 and uh, the original Xbox came along. Uh, so yeah, I started um, playing in consoles as well, and uh, uh, then it was a time when my gaming really became uh, very diversified but uh, as a result less focused less focused I don't know if that's a good or bad thing but uh, maybe at the end of the day it's it's more of a detriment than uh, a gain I mean uh, uh, from from one point of view it's it's a good thing to experience all sorts of games genres and uh, have a uh, how shall I say it? Uh, a more um, holistic view of things, uh, I suppose. But uh, you know, let's face it: there are no, there are so many games, thousands of games. It's Im impossible to play all of them, and it's certainly impossible to play them in a, you know, in a comprehensive way to really get into them and appreciate them uh, not just um, play through them quickly and uh, to beat them um, so yeah coming to the present day my gaming nowadays is in a state of uh, flux I don't know <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm gonna play next I have a huge backlog of unplayed games uh, my time is certainly constrained and limited and uh, on top of that there's another 
torrent of retro games that are piling up as I collect um, old machines that I really have to start uh, thinking uh, rationing my time and sharing it back and forth between modern games older PC games that I want to to play again and even older retro games similar to those that I played during my early PC years but much better because they were much superior versions you know on Commodore and the Amiga and uh, other excellent gaming oriented uh, home computers of the late 80s and early 90s and I want to avoid emulators as much as possible because uh, I've gathered uh, a considerable amount of retro machines during the past couple of years and I, I I really want to find some time to organize them to uh, to present them through this channel and uh, start playing on on real hardware rather than uh, through emulation um, so yeah when it uh, comes to gaming I don't worry too much about um, you know what's what's out there I'm concerned more about the time mm -hmm. uh, you know time at, at this time is perhaps along with my health the, the most precious commodity that I have mm -hmm. you know I don't worry about my financial status I'm relatively secured in that regard but time time is a valuable commodity uh, when I will find time to experience what I want to play and uh, I'm systematically avoiding um, watching let's plays and reviews of other people I want to experience games I don't want to waste my time watching what other people do I, I want to um, only in rare occasions when uh, uh, walk through or a let's play is particularly entertaining and uh, uh, unique um, so I want to, uh, you know, I have uh, most of the of the reviews, even uh, you know, professional reviews. I don't believe in the professional reviews. I've been a, uh, an IT journalist, journalist myself. I think I can spot the bullshit from miles away when I, I listen to or I read. Uh, uh, a review um, if that uh, a review of, uh, of a piece of software or hardware and anyway um, I have uh, most of the times other people's points of view just don't cover me they don't answer, answer my questions and the reason is that I have um, very specific demands from games I don't care about so much about uh, I don't care so much about how good they look or uh, how good they sound uh, or if they are really uh, they're, uh, inno in innovative uh, you know innovation is uh, a word that's been uh, abused and what I care most is the the feeling the game evo evokes in me what it makes me feel uh, the quality of the writing of the storytelling how cohesive uh, the world is uh, how how well they, they flesh out the world but of course I had uh, I said that I have very specific demands from games I think everybody ha has that but uh, uh, you know the usual reviews that uh, they cover you know gameplay story graphics they, 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 they are they cover the the, the the bases they don't you know every everyone is biased uh, a certain way I know what I, I, I want from for myself and uh, so I, I avoid uh, uh, 
reading reviews and uh, uh, I'd rather get into a game uh, unbiased and uh, unprepared uh, of course sometimes <clears throat> that's uh, that results in a, that has a result in, in a disappointing experience but uh, hey you win so you win some you lose some now there are also uh, the sandbox games you know games like minecraft uh, terraria uh, these kinds of games uh, well I can't say I'm compelled to play these kinds of games uh, at some point I was playing uh, you know sim city uh, city building sims uh, quite a lot and uh, I used to play the first two sims games yeah but I don't anymore I don't really care very much about going into uh, a game building uh, a, a, a sandbox game just building stuff or uh, hanging around doing random shit without a story behind it uh, without uh, an, an end goal uh, and, uh, and I don't really enjoy multiplayer uh, multiplayer I'm more of a single player and uh, so I really like story driven uh, adventures um, but I like my occasional racing games my my sports games not uh, not anymore I used to play some uh, sports games football basketball but not anymore I, I really don't care about sports I'm especially since my father died five years ago I, mean, I don't have anyone to, to, to talk about sports and uh, I have absolutely no idea who won what happened it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know the, the players I don't know the teams anymore it's, uh, I just don't care about sports so uh, another aspect of the games that interest me is the lore you know the mythos behind the uh, of the games. Uh, so, you know some franchises have really interesting and captivating, albeit convoluted, backstories and um, you know foundations that can uh, that can literally uh, fill many volumes. Uh, you can. Uh, they are uh, whole novels and uh, um, graphic novels uh, behind uh, the story of these games and some games have uh, spawned a uh, whole series of novels and peripheral reading material uh, that enrich and really flesh out more details and immerse you even deeper into their uh, unique uh, universe uh, there are so many games I rushed through in order to play more games and I regret that for example I played four or five times uh, back to back the first uh, Dragon Sage game Dragon Sage Origins because um, you can uh, play as, as different characters as different uh, race or class and their own the game is different every time but I, I, now I remember very little about the lore of the games, the character, the mythology and it's funny because the other day I was uh, I was having coffee with my good friend George and um, uh, the discussion uh, uh, went into Dragon Sage Origins and he helped me remember some of the characters, you know, Morrigan, Liliana, Flemeth. Uh, these are great characters with great stories behind them. You know, the, this is the kind of uh, thing that I want for my games. Great characters, great writing, great stories. Um, very uh, intricate stories, uh, rich storytelling, um, 
along of course with uh, deep gameplay and uh, lengthy campaigns. I'd like to have some... Um, also, I'd like to um, have some uh, more, uh, you know, some art, some uh, physical stuff, some physical books on the story of, the, of these games or concept art and even uh, perhaps start getting a few collector's editions of the, for some of the most uh, of my most beloved titles you know i re i regret all these years i never um, i never um, bought a collector's edition from uh, the assassin's creed series many people you know um, they really don't appreciate the assassin's creed and i i agree um, it um, at the beginning Assassin's Creed was, uh, you know, perhaps a revolutionary or a more innovative game, and um, it, it, it turned into a you know a Call of Duty style a AAA game with uh, you know no imagination. Uh, and uh, but uh, I really like it because of the of the history of the. Um, different uh, historic locations and uh, you know leaps in time uh, and uh, all the the storytelling and the um, mixing of uh, ancient uh, locations with uh, modern ones um, so yeah I, i'd like to get a collector's edition from the, the assassin's creed series um, Ubisoft uh, uh, are making perhaps the best collectible for this game, for this series, and uh, actually I've um, realized recently that Ubisoft has made an entire in-house division dedicated to collectibles and collector's editions, um, as a matter of fact. I'm waiting for the arrival of my first collector's edition for uh, Assassin's Creed Origins and uh, if everything goes well it will be here by next week so cross fingers uh, so this these days uh, I appreciate having the uh, the physical copies of the games more than ever because of course, Steam and digital distribution is convenient, but you know, having a physical copy, perhaps a collector's edition, makes you appreciate your games more. I guess um, it's perhaps preferable to have a fewer and uh, more carefully selected games rather than a ton of titles that you may not even get to play ever and. Uh, uh, your goal should be to have as as little shovelware as you as you can, uh, so that you don't waste your both your time and money. So um, I don't know. These are my thoughts on this matter. A bit scattered, perhaps, but I guess it's it's fitting, I suppose, because my gaming is also that way it's un unfocused um, there are a ton of other subjects that I'd like to address but I don't think now it's the time to, to do this uh, one major subject is the, the, the for me is the style the aesthetics the artistic style of games um, Sometimes uh, a game can be very playable, it may, may, may be excellent, but something, uh, the, the style, the aesthetics of the, of the game might uh, rub me the wrong way. Um, it, and it's not just the presentation, but also the quality and the depth of the writing, the many aspects of uh, aesthetic uh, presentation, not just the graphics. Of the sound and the music, but uh, also, as I mentioned before, the storytelling. That's why it, it was so excruciatingly painful to go through Mass Effect Andromeda. 
uh, I know I, I invested uh, my money, my time into this game. It was the first game I ever uh, pre-ordered. And um, although the signs were there that it was not going to be so good, I, I was enthusiastic at the beginning because I really liked the first three games, Mass Effect. But as I progressed into the game, it really started falling apart. You know? I mean, uh, my journey through Andromeda was uh, something that I don't think I've ever experienced before and perhaps it deserves a standalone video. Um, well, okay, let, let's do this now because uh, let's keep it short. The thing with Andromeda is that it starts pretty good. It has an impressive beginning. You know, the first levels um, are carefully polished. You know, um, Bioware uh, did this because they wanted to make a good first impression when they let people play the early demo through uh, EA Access. But then, when you go deeper into the story, you start exploring the different worlds and it all crumbles down because of the disappointing quality of the dialogues. The dialogues are, are, are atro atrocious, they're juvenile, they're pointless. Um, uh, the, the side quests are boring, the, the characters are uh, shallow and often one dimensional. They, they, they have only one dimension. They're one dimensional. They, they, the, the story itself is uninteresting to, to, to say the least. The bugs that later, the later stages are uh, the, the, um, the, the poor optimization on the PC that I played. Um, uh, the, 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 the uninteresting big bosses, uh, towards the, especially towards the end, the anticlimactic end, uh, the nonsensical reasoning behind behind your actions here, the lack of motivation, uh, unbelievable. Um, and of course, the, the most disappointing aspect is the total lack of uh, your squad members' customization. I mean, uh, one of the things I liked in uh, my RPGs was uh, you know, to customize their armor, their weapons. Uh, but here, there, there is no armor customization, no weapons customization for your squad mates. Uh, the extremely shallow to non-existent tactical gameplay. Uh, you know, you, you have very, very few commands that you can issue to your squad members. They usually rush right into the, the enemy and they do whatever the hell they want. Uh, you know, the, 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 the incredibly condescending ex machina AI that always, always is holding your hand and it's uh, it's telling you what to do. Oh, this, this button here, I see a button here, maybe you should press it. Oh, look this lever here, maybe you should pull it. Uh, oh, this path, maybe you should take it. And, uh, you know, uh, the AI in the game, your character is implanted with a, a, co a, a permanent connection to, to uh, an AI, and this AI is responsible for everything. Literally everything, leaving you with zero agency and responsibility for your actions. Without your AI, you are nothing. The, pa the Pathfinder is a schmuck. He's a douchebag. You, you, you have your character is, is useless without the AI. You know, and of course, one of the, the best, the, the, the staples of Bioware, the dialogue wheel, which was meaning, had meaningful choices in previous games. In Andromeda, there is no branching story, there, there are no meaningful choices in the dialogue wheel. It's just like they fucked up, uh, like Bethesda fucked up Fallout 4 dialogue. It's a fucking mess. 
so okay there now <laughs> there's no need now I suppose for a separate mass Andromeda mass effect Andromeda final impressions video you know but I, at the end of the day it was a, an experience I won't even characterize it with an with a you know it was an experience disappointing experience nonetheless oh. but you know I had to play this game because I like the series I wish that uh, EA and Bioware hadn't fucked it up so bad to the point that there are no DLCs now uh, officially uh, no continuation nothing they murdered the series uh, and, uh, the studio is sh has shut down, is shutting down, or it's already closed. They are uh, going to just make a stupid uh, novel to wrap the story up with uh, the Quarians because they they promised they had promised that they would turn uh, a separate uh, Quarian story into the DLC. Now it, it's all gone. Excuse me, but um, and it's gone because of bad business decisions. You know, it's not the players' fault, it's not the gamers' fault, or the the journalists' fault. Uh, you, uh, the, when you your your game, your low quality becomes a meme, your bad facial animations, and the facial animations is the the least of the problems. Okay, I, I could I could live with the bad facial facial animations, but when when your uh, one aspect of your game becomes a negative beam on the internet, you are you are fucked. You know, it's it's not that it's, it's all the bad business decisions, uh, the bad management, the bad choices of the executives. Uh, not because we as gamers and consumers didn't buy the game, we bought it, okay? And it did nothing at the end. It's totally Bioware's and DA's fault. And that, that brings up... Uh, it brings us to other matters now. The role of corporations in modern gaming, and what rights do we have as consumers, and uh, if uh, voting with our wallets counts and to what extent our, uh, it affects uh, the industry etc etc but you know if you care only about the story of Mass Effect Andromeda you can uh, uh, and see how bad it is yourself you can go to Smart Boys the channel called Smart Boy on YouTube and watch uh, his uh, playlist of uh, you know the uh, plot analysis of uh, Andromeda and you'll get you know a, a general idea how bad the writing is but <laughs> if you don't actually play the game you will hardly understand how really how bad it is because it's it's not just something you 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 watch or read it's, it's a fucking game you know it's you're putting all this effort and time behind it playing uh, leveling up grinding progressing and the bad writing the shitty story just slaps you across the face instead of rewarding you with a you know a well written and uh, rewarding uh, story so anyway uh, you know, this is getting longer than uh, than uh, I wanted so I'll just uh, wrap it up here and uh, I'll stop here and I hope I will have uh, I will have good news next week unboxing my first my first ever collector's edition so I also have uh, several retro machines to restore and uh, perhaps uh, show off some, a few, a few of them. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Okay. 
Oh, that's all for now. Until next time, take care and uh, stay out of harm's way.